Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's great to be in the Lord's house this morning, and I'm uh, glad that even though we ha had some cold and snow, that we've had have this many people here today. That's, that's a blessing, isn't it? Uh, I'd like you all to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, and we'll read uh, the first 12 verses. <clears throat> Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. When he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you and others who value you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice me glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. May the Lord bless the reading of his word this morning. Uh, let's bow for the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, thank you so much for your son, that you sent him not just as a good teacher, not just as a great prophet, but as our Messiah, our Christ, our Savior, who redeems us and makes us right and adopts us and brings us into a right relationship with you. In him we have all forgiveness of sin. We have the promises and eternal reward of heaven. Help us not to lose sight of that in these times. Lord, help open up to us your word this morning and help us to understand it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I know I read that whole passage of Scripture, uh, the Beatitudes, what they're called, but uh, we're only going to fo focus on the last three verses, verses 10 through 12. Uh, we're living in some evil times, are we not? I've, I, I have, these past two years have been terrible. But from a, as a, as a child, when I was in middle school, I kind of started seeing these trends happening. Uh, the first thing I noticed was on Law and Order SVU, SVU unit, a lot of the criminals and the pedophiles and the rapists somehow turned out to be Christians. They always tended to be Christians on these make-believe TV shows. Uh, the serial killers always had some kind of, ink of of religious agenda. When actually, in reality, it's the opposite. Most serial killers are atheists. The most famous cannibal that we had was Tim Keller. Guess what? He did what he did because he was an atheist. He believed in evolution. He thought, you know, if these people are just animals, and I'm just an animal. All I'm doing is killing another animal and eating it. And that was his mindset. He also knows pornography had a very big impact in that. But in these criminal TV shows, it was always the Christians who were either the prudes, or the bigots, or the serial killers, or the monsters in these, in these TV shows. I noticed a little bit more as I was getting bullied for my faith in Christ. I was called Bible Man. I was called Bible Thumper. I was called a, right, a, a religious wingnut. I was even falsely accused of being a homosexual. I, it was, it was, I noticed this in middle school. And I noticed that my peers were promoting pot for recreational use, for fun. They were promoting sexual lifestyles that were completely against what I knew my teachers were against. And this is what we call the millennial generation. And guess who has grown up and started to get some influence in the world? 
the millennial generation. They are the most anti-Christian, anti-God generation that we have ever seen until Generation Z. Most of them are atheists. They do not know what the Bible is. They would, if you quoted a Bible verse to them, you'd think you'd be speaking, you might as well be speaking fortune cookie sayings. It just goes over their head. They don't hardly have any Bible influence. And it's only by the grace of God that we have that we have teenagers and, and children here today because my generation is so anti-God they don't want to raise their children to know anything about God. And why am I saying this? Well, let's, let's go back to verses 10 through 12. It says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for, they, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice me glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecute the prophets who are before you. I read this verse in middle school, and I realized that the world is going to persecute Christians. Because I love Jesus, because I love the Bible, the world is going to persecute me. And if any of you love the Bible and you love Jesus, the world is going to persecute you and say all kinds of terrible, evil things against you. The reason why a pastor in Congress stood up and he prayed this, we pray to the all-monotheistic God, Brahman, and to, who is known by many names, a man and a woman. The reason why he said that is because he's going against what the Bible says. And then he says, a man and a I know I said this a few weeks ago, and the last pastor here said it, but this still really bothers me, is he is so ignorant of what the Bible teaches that he said that he that he changes a Hebrew phrase, Amen, which means truth or so let it be, and he tries to make it gender neutral, which it never has doesn't have a gender. It just means truth. And he changes it to mean to, to mean a man and a woman. Uh, uh, it's just complete gibberish. And that makes me mad because it shows how biblically ignorant he is, but he's pretending to be a pastor. But the reason why we have that, and the reason why we're going against gender, and going against what the Bible teaches on sex and marriage, is because our culture hates the Bible. And they're trying to get so away from the Bible as they can. How many of you are so afraid to go out in public and share your faith because you're afraid you're going to get looked down at? Or if you say something, they're going to try to shut you down. How many of you are that afraid to go out and say, hey, I'm a Christian? I, I don't know how many people in here are like that, but that's a fear that gets me sometimes. You know, I was in the hospital this last week, and I was admitted, got an IV put in me, I was in lots of pain. And I could have really easily just let it go, let the nurses do their thing. Uh, but I decided to take a leap of faith and ask my nurse uh, if I could pray for them. I'm a Christian. I want to pray for them. And you know what this guy said? No. Thanks. And I could have just left it at that, but I'm kind of stubborn. And I, I said, well, I'm going to pray for you anyways. He said, go ahead. And so for the next two days, I just kept trying to break in and share the gospel with him. And eventually, I was able to hand him gospel tracts. And eventually, I was able to share the gospel with him. And I started doing this really one-nut or one-liner Bible a gospel thing. I was like, I, somebody would ask me, how are you doing? It's all better than I deserve. Like, what do you mean by that? I said, well, I'm a sinner, and I deserve to go to hell because I've told many countless lies. And that means I'm a liar, and that means I, I deserve to go to the lake of fire because the Bible says all sinners will 
have their part in Lake of Fire. But I repented and trusted in Jesus. He forgave me of all my sin. If you repent and trust in Jesus, you will too. It took like maybe 30 seconds to say that. Sharing the gospel isn't that hard. And I was able to talk to this person, give them gospel tracts, pray for them. And I, I think I shared the gospel with about five people while I was sick, even though I could have just, I didn't really do much else. I, I mostly slept and shared the gospel. That's what I did during that time. But the, really, a lot of us are afraid to go out and share our faith when we really shouldn't be, even though the world does hate Christians and it's trying to suppress our right to say the truth. But what this passage is saying, or Jesus is trying to say, is because we belong to God and we will inherit the kingdom of heaven, we should be insanely happy when the world identifies us as that by persecuting us. We should be insanely happy. You see, Christians are happy people because we know the Lord. The word happy or the, the word blessed is actually, if you, if you go back to the Greek, it means happy. You are a happy person. Christians aren't somber, prude, down on, down on the earth people. We are happy. We rejoice. That's why the Bible, the Bible says rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. In fact, this word happy is the same word as happy in Psalm 1. What does Psalm 1 say? It, said, Bless, it says, Blessed is the man, same word happy, who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like the trap the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor stand in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The happy man is one who takes delight in God's revelation, and who drinks deeply from the word. A happy man is the one who knows the Lord Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ knows them. Do you know why the, the, the sinners, the people who thought that they were Christians, at the end of Jesus' message here in the Sermon on Mount, they say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty, mighty miracles in your name? And he says, depart from me, I never knew you. They're languishing because they never had an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. But you know what? Blessed is the man who is persecuted because he knows Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ knows him intimately in a deep love relationship. Another thing that we notice about this passage is the attitudes of happiness are represented in the, in the rest of the Beatitudes. This is what it says. Blessed are the, happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Happy are those who mourn, for they should be comforted. Happy are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they should be satisfied. Happy are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Happy are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Happy are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And those nine happies there are people who are realize that they are poor in spirit. They have no right standing with God in and of themselves. They mourn over their sin. They are meek. They humble themselves. Because that's what repentance is. It's humbling yourself. It's hunger and thirsting for righteousness. You want to be made right with God. It changes you from, a, from, a one, from one who wants to get everything to a merciful person. And it makes you pure in heart. And it makes you at peace with God. That's what repentance is. It's a turning from sin 
to God. And that's what Jesus here is describing in these nine Beatitudes. And I also think that this is, since there's these ten here, poor in spirit, mourning, meat, hunger, pure, uh, peacemakers, and then the two, okay, maybe there's eight. I'm sorry, I miscounted. You ever like it when your pastor does something wrong and then he is, oh, I, I, I just made some. I just missed this. Okay. But basically, all, all the rest of these are positive. This one's a negative, being persecuted. But this, this is one of the things that where you receive a double blessing. He says, what? He said, blessed are you twice. Blessed are the persecuted, and then blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you. He's emphasizing here that we are going to be persecuted and our persecution shows that we are blessed by God because we know the truth. Did you ever think that your persecution is God's blessing in your life? I didn't. I never thought God, that persecution was God's blessing in my life. Until I started reading scripture. I didn't think that my, that my bullies, the people who made fun of me, the people who beat me up, People I'd report to to my teachers. I never thought it was God's blessing in my life. Until I saw it bless the lives of the apostles. <coughs> See in Acts chapter 4. We see the apostles being beaten for the name of Christ. Actually, I think I was wrong about that. That's one where they, they heal the. Uh, that's when that's when they, they heal somebody and the, the council threatened them. I think it's actually. It's actually later on. There we go. It's it's when it's in Acts chapter five. I was a chapter two soon. That's yes, it. Oh, we'll start in Acts chapter 5, 27. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name, yet, they, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree, God exalted him as his right hand as leader and savior to give us repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. They stand. They stand for the truth. This is, this is the second time they stand before the council. And they were, they were are already been warned. You guys are going to be killed if you keep teaching in this name. That's pretty severe. That's worse than losing your house. That's worse than losing your taxes. They were threatened their life in a bloody, gruesome way. And Jesus already warned them. He said, if they this, do this to the master, what do you think that they will do to his servants? And it obviously it says in 33 that they were enraged. And it's really only by this one man of God named Gamaliel that their lives were spared. He says in verse 35, And he said to them, Men of Israel, take care what you are to do, about to do with these men. For before these days Thaddeus rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400 joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Jewish the Galilean rose up in the days of the sentences and drew away many of the people after him. He too perished, and so, and all who followed him were scattered. So in this present case, I tell you, keep away from these men, let them alone, for if this plan is under, is of, or this undertaking is of man, it will fail, but if it is of God, it will not be able to, will, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice. Okay, great, they're going to, be, they're going to let him go, right? These apostles, everything's fine. Wrong. 
when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged beat them. They beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. You know, you see when they beat them, that wasn't a light beating. They beat the apostles with probably rods, because and they probably followed Jewish law because these guys, what they like to do. They like to hold to all the externals of the law, but keep away from all the interiors of the law. Because in the law, you could not be a first person 40 times or else they would die. So I'm pretty sure that, these, that the Sanhedrin, when they had them beat, they were beat 39 times with the rod. Can you imagine being beaten 39 times with the rod? For the sake of Jesus. We're afraid to lose our jobs. We're afraid somebody will dislike us if we tell them about Jesus. But you know what? These men were beaten 30 time, 39 times with the rod for, for Jesus Christ. And then they let them go. But here's what it says in verse 41. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name of and every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. So that's a pretty heavy thing. You see... That's, that's an amazing thing. But they considered persecution a reward. And that's the promise of persecution. We also see the product of persecution. The world persecutes Christians in many, many different ways. The first one Jesus, Jesus mentions in verse 11. Blessed are you and others revile you. What does reviling mean? That is such an old word. I had to look it up in the Greek. And you know what it means? Insulting somebody. Like what, I, like what happened with me when I was in middle school. They called me Bible man. The weak, the, all kinds of bad names. You know, how many of you would like to say that you're a Christian? Raise your hands. How many people like to say you're Christians? Okay. You realize that's an insult to be called a Christian? The reason why we were called Christians in the first place because we were called Little Christ. The Greeks were in Antioch. We're looking at Christians saying, Ha ha, you bunch of Little Christ, you. Promoting the name of Christ. What's up with you, you Christians? It's an insult. You know what? We like that we kept it because we realized Christians are responsibility to act like Christ. Christ, the, the second thing is Christians were persecuted. And the word persecuted can mean to be demeaned, to lose relationships. Like, there's some people when they come to Christ, they have to lose all their friends. Because that, those friends don't want anything to do with Jesus. They have this limited time to share the gospel with, the, with these friends, and then they lose their friends because their friends don't want anything to do with Jesus and because you want everything to do with Jesus they don't want to be with you. You know the people in Muslim countries when they become a Christian you know that they're, that they're being serious because what do they lose? They lose their family and they lose their friends. Oftentimes their family members are the ones that try to kill them because in Islam if somebody brings dishonor to you and your family, they're supposed to kill you. Becoming a Christian is one of the greatest insults to Islam. So guess what? You're a hunted man from your father, your mother, your sisters, your brothers, sometimes even your own spouse. It's a dangerous thing to become a Christian in Islam. Or you could lose your life for the name of Christ. And I don't have to tell you how all the stories of ancient times till now, Christians have been losing their life in the name of Christ. Every 
40 seconds, a Christian loses their life for the name of Jesus Christ. Somebody gets beheaded, somebody gets burned to death, somebody gets shot or stabbed, any, any, any numbers we can imagine. Christians in Nigeria right now, I'll tell you the story real quick, but as Christians were having worship service on Sunday, all of a sudden they heard that famous term, Allahu Akbar. Their church doors got boarded up. And their building was set on fire. And as the flames grew higher and was burning the building, they started singing Christian songs and Christian hymns. And all the church died for the name of Christ. You can lose your life for Christ. Then finally, Christians can also be slandered. And you wonder why Jesus would progress this to slander? Seems like losing your life would be a little bit more severe than slander. But I don't think he's going into progression here. I think he's just he's, he's giving this out. But Christians will be slandered for the name of Christ. You will not die noble deaths when this country turns against Christians. Every... We see the wheels turning, everything. You will not die noble deaths. Christians never have died noble deaths in the name of Christ. You see, Christians were said a lot of evil things about them. They'll say evil things that weren't true. They were Christians were known as prudes because they wouldn't commit fornication. They wouldn't go to these, do these city-wide orgies. They were known as atheists because they wouldn't worship more than one God. And, and, and a God that we couldn't make an idol out of. They were called cannibals because, you know, just like we had the Lord's Supper here today, they said that they would steal babies, kill them, eat the flesh of the baby, and drink its blood. And we said... No, come to communion, you'll see it's just bread and wine. We're remembering Jesus' death until He comes. They were called insurrectionists because they would not sacrifice to Caesar and call Him God. Or burn incense for Caesar and call Him God. They were called rebels for the same reason. And they were called all kinds of evil things for the sake of Christ. Do you know what we're called today? called Trump supporters because we're Christians. I know plenty of friends who are Christians who love the Bible, who love His Word, who weren't Trump supporters. Another hateful term, we're called haters. It's amazing because Christianity is the religion of love. And we're sharing God's love. What else are we called? We're called bigots. We're called People who discriminate. All because we say that marriage is supposed to be between one man and one woman, and any relationship that goes outside of that marriage covenant is a sin. Fornication is a sin, bestiality is a sin, homosexual marriage is a sin, all that's a sin. But you know what else we say? We also say John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son so that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. So if any of those people who live in those sinful lifestyles repent and trust in Jesus, turn from those sinful lifestyles and trust in Jesus, guess what? They'll be saved. And we will not hold them as second class citizens because they will be equal to us in the kingdom of God. It's absurd to call us Bigots for that reason. But when they call you a bigot, 
when they call you a hater, when they call you all these evil, mean things, you're being blessed because you're being identified as one who knows and loves Jesus Christ. Now we, we talked about the promise about persecution. We talked about the product of persecution. And also, persecution makes us into the, brings us into the presence of the prophets. And this would have been a really big thing in a Jewish mindset. Remember, think that you're a Jew in the first century, okay? Who would have been your heroes? The prophets. Moses, Elijah, Jeremiah, all of them. Guess what? They were all persecuted in one way or another. All of them. You see, we will receive heavenly rewards just the same as are those heroes. Actually, even greater because we have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us. We have, and, and we have had Jesus' presence in us. The prophets didn't have that. <laughs> they have it now because they're in heaven. But they didn't have that before. So we're getting the same eternal reward as the prophets. See, we'll be held in that same category as Moses, Isaiah, and Jeremiah. I'd like you to turn to number 16 while we have just a little bit of time left. I want to read you one of the one of the accounts in Moses' life. And you'll get to see a little bit of what being about being like the prophets means. <clears throat> Number sixteen. Now Korah the son of Izhar, son of Kohath, son of Levi, son of Dathan, and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, son of Peleth, the sons of Reuben, took men. And they rose up before Moses with the number of the people of Israel, 250 chiefs of the congregation, chosen from the assembly, well-known men. They assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said to them, You have gone too far. For all in the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? When Moses heard it, he fell on his face, and he said to, Kor to Korah and all his company, In the morning the Lord will show who is his, who is, and who is holy, and, who will bring, and, and will bring him near to him. The one whom he chooses, he will bring near to him. Do this. Take censers, Korah, and and all his company, put fire in them, and put incense on them before the Lord tomorrow. And a man whom the Lord chooses shall be the Holy One. You have gone too far, sons of Levi. And Moses said to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi, is it too small a thing that the Lord God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel, bring you near to himself, to do service in the tabernacle of the Lord, and, and to stand before the congregation to minister to them. Now he has brought you near to him, and, and all your brothers, the sons of Levi, with you. And would you seek the priesthood also? Therefore it is against the Lord that you and all your company have gathered together. What is Aaron that you grumble against him? And Moses sent to Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and they said, We shall not come up. It is a small thing that you brought us out of the land, flowing with milk and honey, to kill us in the wilderness, that you must also make yourself a prince over us. Moreover, you have not brought us into a land of flowing with milk and honey, or given us an inheritance of the fields and vineyards. Will you put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. And Moses was angry and said to the Lord, Do not respect their offering. I have not taken one donkey from them, and I have not harmed one of them. And Moses said to Korah, Be present, you and all your company, before the Lord, you and they, and Aaron tomorrow, and let every one of you take a censer and put incense on it, and every one of you bring before the Lord his censer. Two hundred and fifty censers also, and Aaron and his censer. 
So every man took a censer and put fire in them and laid incense on them and stood at the entrance of the tent of meeting with Moses and Aaron. And Korah assembled with all the congregation against them at the entrance of the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. And the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell on their faces and said, O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin, will you be angry with all the congregation? And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Save the congregation, get away from the dwelling of Korah and Dathan and Abiram. Then Moses rose and went to Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him, and he spoke to the congregation, saying, Depart, please, from the tents of those wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest you be swept away along with all their sins. So they got away from the dwelling of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood at the door of the tents, together with their wives, their sons, and their little ones. And Moses said, Hereby you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, and it has not been of my own accord if these men die as all men die, or if they are visited by the fate of all mankind. And the Lord has not sent me. If the Lord creates something new, and, op and the ground opens up its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them, and they shall go down alive to Sheol, then you shall know that these men have despised the Lord. And as soon as he finished speaking all these words, the ground split under them split apart. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up and all their households, and all people belong to Korah and their gods, so, that, so, so they and all that belonged to them went down alive to Sheol, and the earth closed over them, and they perished in the midst, or they perished from the midst of the assembly in Israel, and all who were around them fled at their cry, for they said, Let the earth swallow us up, and fire came out from the Lord and consumed two hundred and fifty men, offering the incense. That was a very bad day for Moses. You might not know this, but Korah was his cousin. And he stood up against him and said, You're not, I'm going to be the Holy One of God, not you. The ground swallowed, and, and, Mo, and that was the first attack against Moses. Moses always had his life in danger from the Israelites. They were always complaining. They are always grumbling. They are saying, let's stone him. Let's, let's get rid of him. All he was trying to do was follow God's orders. And they just hated him all the time. And now he's the champion of the Jews. It's amazing because a lot of the Jews today wouldn't be listening to what Moses was saying back then. And in the same way, we're not being listened to. We were the champions of Western culture for a time. We start out persecuted for 400 years, or sent until Constantine, so more, more or less 300, 400 years. We were heavily persecuted in the West. Then we had this period of grace, um, and then Christianity's kind of, kind of rised and fallen in, in influence, and then this country got started. And for 200 years, we haven't had much Christian persecution. We've had wars, famines, plagues, all kinds of stuff, but we haven't had Christian persecution. Well, that's coming to an end. It's coming to an end quickly. We live in pretty evil times. And we're the ones saying, this is the word of the Lord. This is the way of the Lord. And we're telling people what the Lord says. And people don't like to hear that. You know why the people hated Jesus? It says it in John 7, 7. It says, the world cannot hate you. It hates me because I say that its, that its deeds are evil. The world hates us because, that's why it says we're bigots, because we call sin a sin, and they, call, and they love their sin. We also tell them if they turn from their sin and trust in Jesus, they'll be saved. To them, that's hate speech. But to us, that's the greatest act of love. Because you do not see somebody walking off a cliff and say, Hey, stop, there's a cliff, you're going to die. Turn this way, you'll live. What we're saying is no more hateful than that. It's the greatest act of love to say that. And then them to turn around and try to kill us and blaspheme us and slander us for that. 
It's ridiculous. But we're being blessed because we're showing whose side we belong to. And in all of this, you either are, and in all of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he says you're either on the side of God and on the narrow path, or you're on the broad path. You're either a good tree or a bad tree. You're either a good builder or a, or a foolish build, foolish evil builder. You're one of those two things. You either belong to God or you belong to Satan. And when Satan's people come out and attack you because you belong to God, that's the greatest blessing you can receive. Uh, and what, we, what do we do when we have that? We rejoice in our sufferings. We're happy for our persecution. Because we've been considered worthy to suffer for his name. And we'll inherit the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, um, I know this is a, it's a hard word, but you, uh, you show us that all who desire to live a godly life will be persecuted. So Lord, prepare our hearts, prepare our hearts to love you and your Son, the Lord Jesus. Help us to suffer for the name of Christ. Because even though the world is going to persecute us, even though the world slanders us and hates us and insults us, it's all for the name of Christ. And we will receive great reward. A reward that's greater than the prophets. Because we have been considered worthy to suffer for the name of Christ. And you will exalt us just like you exalted your son. And we will receive every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And we get to be in your presence and worship you in, your, in all your glory. Help us to be ready for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, the song that we're going to sing.